presentation of the South Carolina Educational Television Network. Major funding for the Voices and Visions series is provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Annenberg Media. Additional series funding is provided by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Arthur Vining Davis Foundation. Sylvia, what about your childhood? Did you live in your imagination a great deal? I certainly didn't have a happy adolescence, and perhaps that's partly uh, why I, I turned specially to writing. I wrote diary stories and so forth. I was quite introverted during those early years. You are about to hear a program on Sylvia Plath. Last Monday, the American poetess and wife of Ted Hughes died suddenly in London. She was 30. She published her first and highly accomplished book of poems, The Colossus, in 1960. But it was only recently that the peculiar intensity of her genius found its perfect expression. <laughs> Sylvia Plath arrived in London around the fall of 1962. She was, what, 30 years old? By this time, she had absolutely irrefutable proof that she was a kind of a, a real poet. I mean, I think a major poet, um, in that the poems had become unstoppable. She'd kind of hit that mother load. You know, it was like Brent Oil or something. She'd gone through and found the reservoir. She was writing poems of an order which seemed to me quite extraordinary for this century not just one a month or one every two months, which is what she'd done before. She was writing two or three a day as though she'd tapped the mother load to end all mother loads of her creativity. Fever, 103. Pure, what does it mean? The tongues of hell are dull, dull as the triple tongues of dull fat. Cerberus, who wheezes at the gate. Incapable of licking clean the aguey tendon, the thin, the thin, the tinder cries. The indelible smell of a snuffed candle. Love, love, the low smokes roll from me like Isadora's scarf. I'm in a fright one scarf will catch an anchor in the wheel. Such yellow, sullen smokes make their own element. They will not rise, but trundle round the globe, choking the aged and the meek, the weak hothouse baby in its crib, the ghastly orchid hanging its hanging garden in the air. She used to get up four doors, rather like John Dunn did the same thing. Up before, you know, in the first grey light. Before the, what's the lovely phrase she used? The glassy music of the of the milkman settling his bottle. And she tried to get in as much as she could before the kids actually stirred. And after that, it was she was a mum. And then by the time evening came, she was probably too exhausted to do anything else. The complication about that is that she was writing an unbelievable amount and with an unbelievable intensity. In terms simply of creative effort, it seems to me there is nothing in English poetry comparable with it except Keats's great year, you know, when he was also writing against the clock. The stuff was pouring out of her, but it wasn't pouring in some unformed lava-like way. It was highly, highly disciplined and skillful. Can 
you say, are there any themes which particularly attract you now as a poet? Well, I think my poems come immediately out of the sensuous and em emotional experiences I have. But I must say, I cannot uh, sympathize with the cries from the heart that are informed by nothing except, you know, a needle or a knife or whatever it is. I, I believe that one should be able to control, to manipulate these experiences with an informed and intelligent mind. She was taking the everyday material of her life, looking after kids, chopping onions, pushing the pram, taking telephone calls, and turning anything that came to hand into poetry. I had always idolized England, because if you're an English major especially, you think that here it all began, and you want to walk under Milton's mulberry tree at Cambridge, and you remember all the Dickens that you read when you were little, and suddenly you go to London and you recognize scenes that you have somehow seen before. And this is simply, I think, a sort of literary influence. I remember being appalled when someone criticized me for beginning just like John Donne, but not quite managing to finish like John Donne. And I felt the weight of English literature on me at that point. As far as language goes, I'm an American. I'm afraid I'm an American. My accent's American. My way of talk is an American way of talk. The poets that excite me most are the Americans. In particular, my background is, um, may I say, German and Austrian. On one side, I'm a first-generation American. On one side, I'm a second-generation American. And I was brought up on, on the northern coast of, of Massachusetts, and my whole childhood was spent on the ocean. I remember the the very spectacular hurricanes we used to have, where my grandmother's cellar would be flooded and there would be sharks washed up in the garden and so forth. And the image of the sea has been with me ever since, even though I've, I've uh, been inland for a few years. And I think one always goes back to, to something as vivid and colorful as this sort of experience. And I know that the sea comes into um, a great many of my poems. Sometimes it's, it's just a a subconscious sea, a sort of flow of thoughts and so on. Other times, it's the real sea itself. We moved from Jamaica Plain to Winthrop in 1937. We had been down there visiting Grandma and Grandpa, who were living at Point Shirley, and the children were so happy on the beach. My husband was failing in health, and that was the real main reason. I wanted to be near my parents. We loved the shore, we loved the house, and I hoped, of course, that he'd recover and that we would live there. And when he was ill, the nurse cut down a uniform and put it on her, and she was her assistant, and she'd bring a cool drink up to her father. She felt very useful. Then, of course, he was sent to the hospital, and he had his leg amputated. The first thing she said, will he have to buy a pair of shoes? And then, of course, when he died, I had to tell the children in the morning that her, her father had died, that he wasn't suffering anymore. And uh, while Warren rejoiced that I was young and healthy and clung to me, Sylvia just slipped underneath the covers of her bed and said, I'll never speak to God again. For she had been praying every night that her father would be well and would come home. She loved his praise. At that time, she was beginning piano lessons and she would play for him. He would pat her on the head and of course, the children had much more freedom in the house after my husband died, and now they could play anything they wanted, anywhere they wanted. All things that would be quiet play. Were you a happy child? Well, I think I was happy uh, up to the age of about nine, very carefree, and uh, I believed in magic, which, which uh, influenced me a good bit. And then at, at nine, I was rather disillusioned. I stopped believing in, in elves and Santa Claus and all these little beneficent powers and became 
more realistic and depressed, I think. And then gradually uh, became, became more adjusted about the age of 16 or 17. When she was eight, I knew that as soon as it got dark, that there would be the emergence of the new moon. And I took both children down to the beach. I carried my son, and she stood by my side. And she more or less drew away, stood apart, and gazed at the moon. And then quietly, I heard her start to say very slowly, the moon is a lock of witch's hair, tawny and golden and red. And the night wind paused and stare at that strand from a witch's head. She learned to type very, very competently from the age of 13 on. I once, for the fun of it, timed her on a standard typewriter. She was going 80 words a minute. She said, the typewriter is an extension of my body. From the age of 10, I put a diary in the Christmas stocking, both for Warren and for Sylvia. Sylvia's, I saw that she had a diary where she had a, a whole page for a day. When she went to junior high, she wanted an unpaginated journal because when the big moments come, one page is not enough. <laughs> Ocean 1212W. When I was learning to creep, my mother set me down on the beach to see what I thought of it. I crawled straight for the coming wave and was just through the wall of green when she caught my heel. I often wonder what would have happened if I had managed to pierce that looking glass. Would my infant gills have taken over the salt in my blood? For a time, I believed not in God, nor Santa Claus, but in mermaids. The road I knew curved into the waves with the ocean on one side, and my grandmother's house. To this day, I remember her phone number, Ocean 1212W. I would repeat it to the operator, an incantation of fine rhyme, half expecting the black earpiece to give me back like a conch, the susurrus of the sea out there, as well as my grandmother's hello. My final memory of the sea is of violence. A still, unhealthily yellow day in 1939. The sea molten, steely slick, heaving at its leash like a broody animal. My father died, we moved inland, she says, in Ocean 1212W. That's the real sort of historical source of the problem. Also, the father died, by the way, in just about the year when World War II broke out. And that was, so there's a kind of connection between public and private that occurs at the time of the death of the father. Uh, but then I think it's very important to see the ways in which throughout her career she mythologizes the figure of the father. The father metamorphoses into a kind of figure with tremendous mythological resonance. Uh, all by yourself, a oh, father, you are pithy and historical as the Roman Forum. The father is a, a vehicle for her through which she can also think about history and think about the world. Plath wrote a poem called The Disquieting Muses, which appears in the Colossus. It's a comparatively early poem. And I think it's a very interesting poem about the ways in which she's torn between being a decorous, good girl who would please her mother and... Uh, being, being a person who is committed to the sort of disquieting forces represented by the muse figures in de Chirico's painting, The Disquieting Muses. The mother figure, though she's based on the real-life mother, is really a kind of metaphor for terrifying female power. I think it's a remarkable poem, but I was hurt by it because she manipulated the reality of the story I told about my own delight in ballet dancing and in music at the end. The first is based fact, uh, pretty factually, but um, 
As a poem, I think it's excellent. The disquieting music. Mother, mother, what ill-bred aunt, or what disfigured and unsightly cousin do you so unwisely keep, unasked to my christening, that she sent these ladies in her stead, with heads like darning apes, to nod and nod and nod at foot and head, and at the left side of my crib? Mother, who made to order stories of Mixie Blackshort, the heroic bear, Mother, whose witches always, always got baked into gingerbread, I wonder whether you saw them, whether you said words to rid me of those three ladies nodding by night around my bed, mouthless, eyeless, with pitched bald head. Day now, night now, with head, side, feet, they stand their vigil in gowns of stone. Faces blank as the day I was born. Their shadows long in the setting sun that never brightens or goes down. And this is the kingdom you bore me to, mother, mother. But no frown of mine will betray the company I keep. In the early poems in the Colossus, you can see that she's really trying to work within very strict forms. She's counting syllables. She's read Marion Moore. She's, as I said, she's read uh, Thomas. She's, she's writing villanelles and sonnets. I mean, reams of them. Uh, very often in the Colossus, the forms seem inert, almost as if they were like the kind of black shoe that the poet inhabits as a poor white foot in, in Daddy later on. She seems to be confined or constrained by them. But nevertheless, obviously, all of that work with strict forms made possible the later kind of explosion of language that you get in Ariel. In her early poetry goes through a number of sort of imitative phases. She's influenced by W.H. Auden. She was always passionate about Yeats, certainly from the time she was at Smith. When I was at college, I was stunned and astounded by the moderns, by Dylan Thomas, by Yeats, by Auden even. At one point, I, I was absolutely wild for Auden. Everything I wrote was, it was desperately Auden-esque. Sylvia Plath went to Smith uh, in 1950. I think that the impact of Smith was enormous. She was a ferociously ambitious and gifted student. And she did a tremendous amount of reading. I think we have to remember that she was a highly sophisticated sort of graduate student in the end and a, and a literary critic. And that Smith was very important in fostering that part of her. But again, even throughout the Smith years, there's the kind of tension that I was talking about in, dis in the disquieting muses. That is the tension between her commitment to academic intellectual activity on the one hand and on the other hand, her desire to be a sort of popular, red-blooded, all-American girl. She was a little bit afraid because she felt that most of the girls at Smith would come from private schools and she didn't know if she could stand up to them scholastically, especially in French. But I had her tutored that summer in French so she would be at ease. After the first mocking period, she wrote home. She said, I think I'm going to make it. She loved going to a girl's school because uh, there was no competition uh, with boys. And she always had felt with a boy that she should pull back and not exert all that she had. The transition academically was a very easy one for her because she had been an omnivorous reader. And we had, of course, talked about many of the uh, materials that she came across in college. But I think the freedom that she experienced there, and perhaps was difficult for her, I think she, in a sense, felt a liberation that she did not feel while I had her as a student. There was the academic atmosphere, which is one thing, and then there was the, the social atmosphere, the, the way that she lived. Well, social atmosphere is very amusing to describe it to students nowadays. Uh, there, was, there was some effort to make the Smith girls into, into ladies. The various dormitories, which are always at Smith called houses, each had a, a house mother. It was the house mother's duty to enforce certain rules and, and regulations, also to keep up certain standards of gentility. There were dress clothes. You had to wear skirts or dresses for, for dinner. And then coffee served in the living room after dinner in demi-tasses. 
There were also lots of protocol about receiving male guests. No man, not your brother or father, was ordinarily allowed above the first floor. When Sylvia Plath was at Smith College, she won a guest editorship to Mademoiselle. The magazine brought her and a number of other girls to New York in the summer of 1953. You can see why Mademoiselle precipitated the kind of breakdown that it did. All of the kinds of tensions in the culture that were in the back of her life as, a, as an American girl at that time must truly have come to a head and been almost dramatized, theatricalized during the Mademoiselle experience. You know, I had a letter from Sylvia from New York. This was just before she came home. And she said, you'll never want to see me again, Mr. Prophet. I have let you down. And I puzzled over the letter. I didn't realize that she was at her rope's end. And I was vacationing in New Hampshire when news of her disappearance came. There was a great deal of attention at the time. The New York Times had a, lo a long account of Smith, well-known Smith girl, you know, disappearing. Finally, of course, she was found in her home after a period of two or three days. She came home and that was when she had her breakdown. She couldn't, she couldn't concentrate. She couldn't read. She just uh, wasn't the same girl that went. And that's when she started. Well, she. The only thing she read was Freud's abnormal psychology and found all sorts of symptoms that she was sure applied to her, and felt that she'd be a burden to the family the rest of her life and uh, couldn't go back and take up her studies at Smith. She just felt she couldn't read or do anything. And uh, when she came to consciousness after her first attempt, the first thing she said, that was my last act of love. There were two words that she used a great deal. One was always and the other was never thing was either always or it was never. Everything was magnified. I never knew anyone to reach the heights of joy that she reached at times. No, the depths were absolute despair, <laughs> ricochet. The suicide attempt was hugely important. She had periods of chronic, more or less psychotic depression, but she also had huge energy immense kind of fight and drive and energy. The suicide, to some extent, was linked with a kind of arrogance. Lady Lazarus is about, I can get through this too. You think, you think you've think you got me, you haven't got me. Rising from the dead, and I eat men like air. It's a kind of angry poem. It's a, it's a declaration of war. She wasn't a kind of passive victim in any conceivable way. She was one tough cookie. Lady Lazarus, I have done it again. One year in every ten I manage it, a sort of walking miracle, my skin bright as a nasty lampshade, my right foot a paperweight, my face a featureless fine Jew linen. The first time it happened, I was ten. It was an accident. The second time I meant to last it out and not come back at all. I rocked shut as a seashell. They had to call and call and pick the worms off me like sticky pearls. Dying is an art, like everything else. I do it exceptionally well. I do it so it feels like hell. I do it so it feels real. I guess you could say I have a call. She talked about suicide as something that she had once had a go at, and it was as if she had once played tournament tennis or something like that, something that Sylvia had done. And she loved to show her scars and tell the story of her smashing on the basement floor, whatever it was, and how lo the for life force in her, she said, the life force in her was so strong that it counteracted all those pills she'd eaten 
and up Sylvia popped. Sylvia won a Fulbright scholarship to study English at Newnham College in Cambridge, England in 1955. That, as much as anything, probably helped her recover from the nervous breakdown. She threw herself into student life, and among other things, she was active in the Footlights, the Cambridge Amateur Dramatic Society. She must have been rather lost at Cambridge. I should think Sylvia was astonished to discover the difference between a woman's college in the States and a woman's college in Cambridge University. Utterly astonished. Whoever she was, how often she was published, got herself done up as a model for some magazine. It wouldn't have meant anything. They don't have stars at Oxford or Cambridge. One of the things that I think I like most about the English is their, their ability to be eccentric, to be themselves to such an extent that they're strikingly different from anybody else. The most important thing at Cambridge was her further study in modernism and her readings of particularly Woolf and Yeats. She says in her journal when she's at Cambridge that uh, Virginia Woolf makes my work possible. Uh, then she's also, of course, rather rivalrous and says that I will do better than she did. Even during the Cambridge experience, she continued to be divided between a kind of deep commitment to intellectual, academic, aesthetic activity, and on the other hand, uh, an urge toward being the popular all-American Fulbright scholar abroad. A story that was published in the Cambridge newspaper with the headline, Sylvia Plath tours the stores and models new spring fashion. There are amazing pictures of Plath modeling a bathing suit on the front cover of this Cambridge newspaper. And uh, she sent a copy of the newspaper to her mother with the inscription, um, with love from Betty Grable. So there's the same tension. Does she want to be Virginia Woolf? Does she want to be a female reincarnation of William Butler Yeats? Or does she want to be Betty Grable? In February of 1956, she met Ted Hughes. The tales that she tells in her journal are quite splendid about meeting and biting the great English genius and then fell in love with the man. But one knows perfectly well. If Ted Hughes had been Ted Hughes and hadn't written poetry, I don't think it would have been the same story at all. He had to be important. Ted Hughes had enormous influence on her work um, because he also was, in a very Laurentian way, looking at the underside of life, was, was dealing with the big, dark feelings. I'd never be writing as I am and, and as much as I am without Ted's understanding and cooperation, really. All the poems that we wrote to each other and about each other were really before our marriage, and then something happened. I don't know what it was. I, I hope it was all for the good, but we began to be able to, well, somehow free ourselves for other subjects. He taught her. He helped her find her own voice. I think that's very important, um, and I'm sure that you know, were she alive today, um, and even if they w were not still together, um, she would be the first to admit that. Ted's interest in animals made me look back into my own life. And my father, um, among other things, was a biologist and happened to keep bees. And I, oh, I, I didn't think much about this at the time, but I've become very interested in, in beekeeping, and, and the image of beekeeping has become part of my poems. And I think this is a direct result of of knowing Ted. I somehow know more about my own past uh, through him than I, than I would otherwise. The bee poems are a mythologized way of dealing with the relationship with the father, who was an expert in bees, the author of a book called Bumblebees and Their Ways. Also a way of coming to terms with issues having to do with fertility and creativity. Plath began to learn to keep bees after the birth of her son, and it was the local midwife who inducted her into this strange ceremonial world of beekeeping. There's a great deal in the beekeeping poems that has to do with, with childbirth. Again, the tension this time between the self that's sexually fertile and the self that's aesthetically fertile. The Beekeeper's Daughter. A garden of mouthings purple, scarlet speckled, black, the great corollas dilate, peeling back their silk. Their musk encroaches, circle after circle, a well of scents almost too dense to breathe in. 
higher attical in your frock coat, maestro of the bees, you move among the many-breasted hives. My heart under your foot, sister of a stone. In burrows narrow as a finger, solitary bees keep house among the grasses. Kneeling down, I set my eye to a whole mouth and meet an eye, round, green, disconsolate as a tear. Father, bridegroom, in this Easter egg under the coronal of sugar roses, the queen bee marries the winter of your year. He told her that he could catch bees. They wouldn't sting him. They were the male bees. And he caught a bee. This must have been at the end of the summer when the males had emerged. And he, he held it to her ear, and she heard the buzzing of the bee. And then he let it go. And she thought it was very wonderful. Her father was very masterful. He could catch bees, and they wouldn't dare to sting him. Great love of her father. Great love. Sylvia seems to have fabricated him. Sylvia was a product, really. A product of immigrant family, intense ambition of her mother. That was Sylvia's love of her father. That he himself may have been quite an ordinary man, but that he had been Sylvia's bastion against her mother. That when he died, then they really let all rip and just took Sylvia over and to become this model little girl, almost the way it must have happened with child film stars. Towards the end of the Colossus, she discovered Theodore Retke, who also wrote, in his best period, um, poems about, um, about an overpowering father. It's a question of her finding her own voice. This is what every writer in any medium does. When you're young, you shop around, don't you? What Eliot said, you know, immature poets imitate mature poets steal. And what he meant by that is you shop around for styles when you're young, when you're working it out, finding out who you are. You try on various suits. Then later, you finally discover your own voice. In the Colossus, she is enclosed in the kind of patriarchal history that the father comes to represent. She's enclosed in this figure of, of the sort of gigantic god father figure, the dead father. She is inhabiting him. She squats in his left ear. She, she tries to put him together. Uh, she, she isn't really sure whether she wants to escape from him or whether she wants to reconstruct him. The Colossus. I shall never get you put together entirely, pieced, glued, and properly jointed, Mule bray, pig grunt, and bawdy cackles proceed from your great lips. It's worse than a barnyard. Perhaps you consider yourself an oracle, mouthpiece of the dead, or of some god or other. Thirty years now I have labored to dredge the silt from your throat. I am none the wiser. A blue sky out of the Oristia arches above us. O oh, Father, all by yourself, you are pithy and historical as the Roman Forum. It would take more than a lightning stroke to create such a ruin. Nights, I squat in the cornucopia of your left ear out of the wind, counting the red stars and those of plum color. I have one photograph that I put myself behind the reader in our flat. <laughs> Please note the very large wedding ring. This is not usual in my condition at all. But it's a kind of a, a symbol of how seriously he took the marriage. And in a strange, ironic way, what a wonderful husband he was. The first stage was obviously that he was very much in love with her. The second possibly was that he felt that she would be better and happier and that he could save the marriage if there were children 
she became or began to become a real person. And the artifices were peeling away, which obviously they do when you have children. And it meant an enormous amount to Sylvia that she just had Frida. Frida was just plain born without being dragged from her in some sterilized hospital. She loved the word midwife. She was always using that. Not that it was rather splendid. My midwife, she said. Has the baby made a big difference to the running of the house? Well, actually, I, I was amazed when I, I um, found how easy she was. I had wondered if I'd be swallowed up in uh, motherhood and, and never uh, feel any time to myself. But somehow she's fitted in beautifully and is amazingly little trouble. I mean, she doesn't yell and cry and she plays by herself and is very uh, amusing. And I think both of us have, have uh, written a good many poems to her and find her more entertaining than, than uh, anything. I think we're, we're both often. very much family oriented. I mean, I, I envision a, a large house sort of stocked with small children and small animals. Where do you live? Really up by Primrose Hill in the zoo. That's one of the reasons we like it so much. We're always going to the zoo with the baby and so forth. We can hear the seals barking in the summertime. They absolutely fell in love with our district, which was on and around from Rose Hill. They adored it. Everybody does. I mean, it's, it's uh, very beautiful. But it's not only lots of trees and lots of grass, but it, it undulates. It looks like the country. Sylvia and Ted went back to America in 1957, where she taught for a year at her old college, Smith. Then they decided that academic life wasn't for them. So they returned to England, spent about a year in London in a cramped little apartment near Primrose Hill, and then they found themselves a lovely old house in a rather run-down village in Devon. As usual, Sylvia got herself involved in village life. She took up beekeeping, and learned to ride on a rather stolid old horse called Ariel. It was in Devon that she finally discovered her own powerful, authentic voice and wrote many of the poems that were later collected in Ariel. And it was in Devon that her marriage began to go wrong. The Moon and the Yew Tree is one of those kind of crucial poems where you can see everything happening, that you can see the old Sylvia and the new Sylvia coming together. The inspiration for the poem was, in fact, an exercise Ted gave her. He said, why don't you write about the tree in the churchyard near the house? So she got up at four in the morning and wrote a poem about that, although the result was a long way from what Ted had expected. The grasses unload their griefs on my feet as if I were God, prickling my ankles and murmuring of their humility. Fumy, spiritous mists inhabit this place, separated but from my house by a row of headstones. I simply cannot see where there is to get to. Now, the point about that is the opening lines, the fumy spiritus mists and prickling my ankles and murmuring of their humility, that's old style. That's elegant, um, elegi um, elegiac, very, um, very carefully cadenced, very beautiful, very cadenced, yeah? And then suddenly there's this voice comes out. I simply cannot see where there is to get to. The moon and the yew tree. This is the light of the mind, cold and planetary. The trees of the mind are black. The light is blue. The grasses unload their griefs on my feet as if I were God, prickling my ankles and murmuring of their humility. Fumy, spiritous mists inhabit this place separated from my house by a row of headstones. I simply cannot see where there is to get to. The moon is no door. It is a face in its own right, white as a knuckle and terribly upset. It drags the sea after it like a dark crime. It is quiet with the ogape of complete despair. I live here. Twice on Sunday, the bells startled the sky. Eight great tongues affirming the resurrection. At the end, they soberly bong out their names. The yew tree points up. It has a gothic shape. The eyes lift after it and find the moon. The moon is my mother. 
She's not sweet like Mary. Her blue garments unloose small bats and owls. How I would like to believe in tenderness. The face of the effigy gentled by candles, bending on me in particular, its mild eyes. I have fallen a long way. Clouds are flowering blue and mystical over the face of the stars. Inside the church, the saints will be all blue, floating on their delicate feet over the cold pews, their hands and faces stiff with holiness. The moon sees nothing of this. She is bald and wild, and the message of the yew tree is blackness, blackness and silence. It's a kind of perfect changeover poem where she's speaking. All the stuff is being cast away, which is what she's talking about in the aerial poem as well. Casting away the shells so that the naked person is there. With a poem like Ariel, there's a kind of ghost text behind the real text which is the poem as it would be if you rewrote it in blank verse. The poem itself seems to me the most extraordinary and beautiful thing because it's got the two elements that were in her. That is, it's immensely disciplined. It's got all that 50s apprenticeship in. And at the same time, it's totally free. The rhymes have become subtle and internal. The actual scheme of the thing is very intricate, very ingenious. There isn't a spare fragment of a word in it. Everything matters. It's about getting on this horse and being released from all trouble. It's just go. Ariel. Stasis in darkness. Then the substanceless blue pour of tor and distances. God's lioness, how one we grow. Pivot of heels and knees. The furrow splits and passes. Sister to the brown arc of the neck I cannot catch. Nigger eye berries casting dark hooks. Black sweet blood mouthfuls. Shadows. Something else hauls me through air, thighs, hair flakes from my heels. White Godiva iron peel, dead hands, dead stringencies. And now I foam to wheat, the glitter of seed. The child's cry melts in the wall. And I am the arrow, the dew that flies, suicidal at one with the drive into the red eye, the cauldron of morning. In the aerial poem, she's let herself go. She stopped being what she called Roger's trollop. She stopped using her thesaurus, as she had done in her earlier poems. And uh, she, she just surrendered to whatever the dark forces in her were that were represented by the disquieting muses. She had peeled herself to such a slim core, getting rid of these artificial selves, these delusions. And at the same time, she was utterly lost without her old self, without the Sylvia Aurelia, the Sylvia Ed Smith, the Sylvia with Ted. All that was gone. She didn't want any of it anymore. She wanted to be herself. Probably Sylvia saw all women as rivals, thinking about it. She obviously felt insecure with Ted right from the beginning, but nobody would have known it. Astia went to Devon to visit, but Astia fancied poets. She, I think she'd had three or four. And her latest poet was but with no great interest to her. Nothing compared to Ted Hughes, who by this time was really very famous. Sylvia must have been full of jealousy. Her great marriage to her prince was always a gift she was going to give Aurelia. This tremendously happy marriage. Of course, it was all in her head, really. And of course, it had all fallen apart. The implication that went off with that was absolutely false. And it left for a whole lot of reasons. Sylvia had been steadily punishing, making cease, carrying on as no one who can see it can imagine. She said the worst thing that happened was when she broke my word. She was pathologically jealous. She was brilliant. She was dazzlingly intelligent. She was unbelievably 
talented in every way, but it was a sort of unwisdom, a sort of uh, lack of self-criticism and a sort of self-justification, uh, and it, which gave her an absolute blind spot about cause and effect. If you continually punish someone when there's no reason to punish them, something is going to go eventually. She was full of anger. I mean, anger, after all, is part of grief. It's part of the process of mourning, as they say, that um, if somebody dies, and they die very suddenly, you may feel stricken with grief because they're not there, but you also feel very angry. You feel you've been abandoned. Yeah, So you feel kind of storming anger. Very difficult to express, I mean, say, because it's not appropriate when, when there's a death in the family. It is totally appropriate when, um, you, you, when a marriage breaks up. Suddenly she had her occasion. The devil took her by the throat and shook her. But she was all ready at that point. She was prepared. She'd done her first apprenticeship. But she was creating the situation in which she could write Ariel. I'm absolutely convinced of. She needed to be that amount destructive of both herself and everything that mattered to her in order to get to the raw material of Ariel. Many of the things the, the, the woman's movement was concerned with, particularly in its earlier years, that she was concerned with, and is really a kind of a pioneer that way. Um, I, mean, I know that lots of people object to her using sort of images of the concentration camp in this, what seems to them, this sort of uh, self-serving way. Uh, you know, I, Sylvia Plath, have tried to kill myself and look at me, I'm like a Jew, I'm so forth. But I never saw it that way. I really saw her as trying in some of her aerial poems to make, uh, to make a new mythology of women, which is a, a kind of a task that women poets now are very well aware of. I don't want to see Ariel as a long suicide note uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, I do think that it is the case that uh, whether or not she had died in the way she did, Sylvia Plath would have had to suffer in her own body some of the stresses that, that women have been suffering since the end of the modernist period. Those last poems are about facing your demons. And they're about facing what you really feel rather than what you think you should feel. In order to write those last poems, she shed all the earlier poetic formulae that she had acquired during her long apprenticeship. Otto E. Plath was absolutely chucked inside Sylvia Plath. There, everywhere with her, as if he were sort of turning the key that made her move. And in order for her to be a real person, Sylvia had to move her father outside of herself. It was hatred of that slavish bit in herself that had got stuck, got stuck to this probably imaginary father. Daddy was the only poem that she ever read to me. And for years afterwards, when word came about, after Sylvia was dead, of course, and she became rather famous, and word was spread around about the hate in that poem. How could anybody be so vicious and revengeful and full of hate towards their father? Of course I knew there wasn't that at all. I howled laughing. I still laugh. Very, very funny. And wonderful nursery rhyme stuff. Booty him out the door. Out, out. Wonderful. I knew Sylvia didn't hate her father. Ten minutes before, next day, there she was, talking about how wonderful he was, how she loved him, loved him. And the daddy that she's shouting at, out, 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 daddy, is the daddy inside of her, not her beloved father. Daddy, you do not do, you do not do any more black shoe in which I have lived like a foot for 30 years, poor and white, barely daring to breathe or hut chew. Daddy, I have had to kill you. You died before I had time, marble heavy, a bag full of God, ghastly statue with one gray toe big as a Frisco seal. Not God, but a swastika, so black no sky could squeak through. Every woman adores a fascist, the brute in the face, the brute, brute heart of a brute like you. You stand at the blackboard, Daddy, in the picture I have of you, a cleft in your chin instead of your foot. 
But no less a devil for that, no, not any less the black man who bit my pretty red heart in two. I was ten when they buried you. At twenty, I tried to die and get back, back, back to you. I thought even the bones would do. But they pulled me out of the sack and they stuck me together with glue. So, Daddy, I'm finally through. The black telephone's off at the root. The voices just can't worm through. There's a stake in your fat black heart, and the villagers never liked you. They are dancing and stamping on you. They always knew it was you. Daddy, daddy, you bastard, I'm through. Courageously, really rather audaciously, Sylvia had been throwing everything out the window. And inside, Sylvia was exceedingly frail. And then these mysterious fevers, mysterious, no explanation. Why wouldn't they go away? Fevers in Devon, and then in London, fevers again, fevers, fevers, fevers. Boiling, boiling hot, being burned up. The last time I saw Sylvia was in early January, in 1963, and she had come to London with two little children, aged almost three and almost one, bravely had come, found this flat, Yates' house, which meant an enormous amount to her. And there she was, quite well known by now. Sylvia Plath's name was big in the world of poetry, at least the people who read poetry. I saw her in January in Fitzroy Street, and I just felt strongly, strongly, strongly that loneliness of the, the house, of her, of the situation. And when everybody was as young as we were, it was almost impossible to imagine living alone. Divorced women in those days were considered prey or fools or hags, unwanted. The feeling of loneliness was very strong. It was the worst winter in living memory. It was just unspeakable. The whole of London froze. The whole of England froze. She had flu, sinus, whatever it was. She was chronically depressed. Um, and effectively, uh, her friends, me included, abandoned her. She was very difficult. She was almost psychotically depressed and couldn't see any way out. You get yourself locked into the, a kind of closed world and there was no way out. I think it was a, an inbred fear that what she loved would leave her sometime. And I think it haunted her all her life without her making it known in words. I never was aware of it until I gathered poems together and found this pattern running straight through. If you are handling, as it were, material as volatile as that, then you, you know, it's like terrorism, you, um, poetic terrorism, you risk it blowing up in your face. If you're pushing on the friable edge, it can break. Yeah, I knew that young poets always conjecture about the mystery of death and afterlife, but I felt that she should go away from it and live more in the present, right, of the present rather than always referring to the past that had hurt her so. The woman is perfected. Her dead body wears the smile of accomplishment. The illusion of a Greek necessity flows in the scrolls of her toga. Her bare feet seem to be saying, we have come so far, it is over. Each dead child coiled a white serpent, one at each little pitcher of milk, now empty. She has folded them back into her body as petals of a rose close when the garden stiffens 
and odors bleed from the sweet, deep throats of the night flowers. The moon has nothing to be sad about, staring from her hood of bone. She is used to this sort of thing. Her blacks crackle and drag. Major funding for the Voices and Visions series is provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Annenberg Media. Additional series funding is provided by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Arthur Vining Davis Foundation. For information about this and other Annenberg Media programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org.